to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Justin Clark. I'm Madam Cronin. And today we're discussing the future of space travel. So that means we'll get into why the current methods of space travel are so inefficient, how we can innovate with new methods for getting to outer space, and what each scenario will mean for the future of humanity and life beyond Earth. So Madam maybe to start, you describe what the current state of space travel is and also a concept known as the skyhook. Definitely. So the problem with current status of space travel is that if you've ever seen a rocket, it's basically this cylinder of tons and tons of fuel and thrusters with this tiny little tip of payload. And, yeah. you know, currently the biggest thing we could get into space is the Falcon Heavy from SpaceX, which brought in you know starman which is a tesla roadster and that's the heaviest thing we can bring into space right now and that's something that we can only bring into space because it's fairly close it's just orbiting earth right but if you want to go further if you want to go to mars for instance then you need all of this fuel to escape earth's atmosphere and then you need half of your fuel just to slow down when you're approaching mars and then if you want to actually get back to Earth, you would need double that amount of fuel. So there's this mm -hmm. major problem where it's huge fuel requirement. And it's also dangerous because you have like basically all of these explosives along with you <laughs> while you're traveling yeah. in this rocket. And it also pollutes the environment. Um, so mm -hmm. there's a lot of issues with current space travel. Now, the idea of the skyhook is fascinating and i recommend to any of our listeners this video from kurtz gesagt uh, the youtube channel justin you actually showed me the skyhook video so thank you for that but <laughs> essentially this idea is so simple but it's so potentially game-changing so you could have this giant tether which is just like a really strong fiber optic rope with mm -hmm. a big weight on one side and then a small counterweight on the other side and you put this in Earth's orbit so that basically it's just spinning around and allowing for a catapult-like mechanism where you wouldn't have to use fuel to get all the way out of Earth's atmosphere. You would just need to get about 100 kilometers above Earth's surface and then you latch on to this giant space hook and that catapults you into space using the momentum it has. And you could do this to get to Mars, you could do this to get to the moon, you could have another space hook on Mars that catches you as you approach and then hurls you back mm -hmm. so that you're keeping the same amount of momentum in the sky hook. So, and then you could basically yeah. put these between anywhere we would want to go in our solar system and have much less fuel usage. It's safer. It's, it works with current engineering knowledge it's not like we'd have to invent something brand new like a space elevator for mm -hmm. instance um so yeah i think it's a fascinating idea i'm interested to hear your thoughts on it yeah there's a couple things to point out as well and i think the first is we have the technology to do this today we have the materials to make this long tether that's spinning around today mm -hmm. that will withstand all of the radiation potential debris potential asteroids and meteors and it's it's this first step that we can use to build infrastructure into space so if you think of the earth like pre-infrastructure that means no roads no nothing really no buildings it's just kind of a a willy-nilly travel exploration yeah, it's like um, lewis and clark with wagons and sweat and yeah, blood and, and tears and, they didn't have yeah it was it was ridiculous and and we're kind of at that stage in space travel we don't have infrastructure but this space tether or this the sky hook could really get us to the next level soon mm -hmm. and the next level is really exploring our solar system efficiently so kind of like you said we could have uh these sky hooks in uh or on mars and there are a couple you know things to think about so every time a spaceship attaches itself to the skyhook the skyhook loses a little bit of momentum 
Mm-hmm. And if there's nothing that maintains that momentum, then the skyhook will lose um, speed and crash into the atmosphere, which is obviously a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are ways that you can counteract that. So like if it catches faster objects coming from Mars or the moon or something, um, then that'll actually give the skyhook more momentum, which is pretty right. cool. You probably so have to have else. some sort of rule where for every rocket ship that launches from earth you need a similar Mm -hmm. rocket ship to come back to earth both using the skyhook so you have the same Mm -hmm. momentum and Mm -hmm. you could have some small thrusters on the skyhook to amount to account for like small differences in momentum Mm -hmm. changes right and then also in the video and again like you said i recommend that everybody uh, watches the kirkskasat video but there's also a moon around mars that has a ridiculous mass which basically means we don't have to worry about it losing momentum so basically on this moon you could have two tethers kind of spinning around this thing and and orbiting with the moon and uh, it would be a very quick um, uh, path or a very quick rotation for the mars skyhook potentially which could then launch into asteroid belts and then we could mine those asteroids for certain rare materials that are useful for developing a mars colony like it's Mm -hmm. it's really just a a first step and you know the first step is building one on earth um but then after that it's the first step with having real space infrastructure yep yeah yep and then we wouldn't have to deal with all of the costs associated and the risks associated with having 80 percent of the rocket or more being explosive fuel right yeah, another interesting um infrastructure proposal is not so much something we would need to do but more of just a way of thinking about how we get fuel into space and mm-hmm. i was watching this ted talk and this uh, rocket scientist proposed that we could actually use the gravitational pull of various planets and various moons and various asteroids as sort of an inter- interstellar superhighway where using mm-hmm. a lot less fuel, you could basically launch these like essentially, um, you know, grab bags of fuel and whatever other supplies astronauts would need along the way using the gravitational pull of different planets so that you're basically like using the you know, the pull so that it goes in a certain path. And that's not Mm. something we've done with spaceships because it takes a lot longer, right? You're not taking the direct linear path from here to Mars. You're instead going like around the moon and then around this planet and around that planet. And so it's a lot less Mm. fuel usage, but uh, it takes a lot longer. So it wouldn't make sense to use that for rocket ships, but you, you you could use it to have enough resources to resupply while you're en route to Mars, which would be another, mm. another good way. Uh, to right. So if it. you're, if timing isn't an issue, like if, if it's just supplies or, you know, some sort of payload that isn't a human, then it's okay to take maybe a meandering path through the solar system. Right. So you could pick these up on the way. Um, and, and perhaps, uh, perhaps next we should just talk about, what are the different types of spacecrafts, rocket ships that have been proposed for improving upon what the status quo is? So like we said, right now, it's pretty much just rockets that are a ton of fuel that blast these spaceships in a very sort of traditional way. Is there a way we could greatly increase our range of space travel and increase the efficiency and the speed at which we can get there. So maybe yeah, I mean, uh, this, maybe we first talk about some light sail. Because I'd, I'd like to yeah. start with what are some things that have actually been validated and tried, uh-huh. and then maybe towards the end we get towards like you know far future things like warp drive and black holes mm-hmm. and that kind mm-hmm. of thing. So maybe to start, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on light sails, um, that yeah. kind of technology. Yeah, so a, a light sail is actually a pretty simple technology. It's really this this really giant reflector device that, let's say, it's in space and it's just sitting out there. 
the photons from the sun go and hit the sail. And then when they're reflected back, then that uh, increases the speed of this the space object or the space um, craft a little bit at a time. Mm -hmm. And the photons are hitting this light sail at light speed. And theoretically, you can use the energy of the sun, at least when you're close enough to a star, to power these light sails to a relatively large fraction of the speed of light. Some say we can even get to 10% of the speed of light with light sails. Um, right. Yeah. And this has already been validated through mm -hmm. Japan did a mission mm -hmm. that they called Icarus. And mm -hmm. they used light sails to actually pass by Venus in 2010. So this mm -hmm. is something that we already know works. But like you said, the main limitation is that the further away you get from the sun, the less powerful it is. So mm -hmm. if we wanted to go beyond the sun and explore other solar systems, then that probably wouldn't be the best solution. The other issue mm -hmm. is that you need really giant, essentially solar panel reflectors to mm -hmm. get enough speed. So the amount of mass that you can hold is you know, proportional to how big your solar panels are. So it becomes yeah. this like giant delicate object if you want to bring anything that's massive enough. But you, it, it's a great solution if you just want like a tiny probe like the one that Japan right. did. Mm -hmm. um, and there's this really interesting project called Project uh, Star Breakthrough Starshot. Have mm -hmm. you have you heard about that? I one? actually haven't. I'm curious. So Breakthrough Starshot, I think it was a bunch of Russian billionaires that initially decided this was something they wanted to do. But the nearest solar system, other than our solar system, which is around the sun, is Alpha Centauri, mm -hmm. and that seems to be a place that may have life similar to Earth, just based on what we know about the sun, how close the other parts of, you know, the planets and whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's been this initiative where maybe we can actually send a probe there and get it back, not in hundreds of years or thousands of years, which would be the speed of our current spaceships, mm -hmm. but maybe in the next 20 years. So we can actually live to see the results. And the way they're doing this is they're actually going to take thousands of these tiny little nanoprobes, like these little microchips that are basically just like a little radio receiver that can send back little bits of, of uh, you know, information that it gathers. Mm -hmm. And then you use a laser beam to speed these things up to like 10 or 12 percent of the speed of light. And... Some of them will may disintegrate from the lasers, but the idea yeah. some of them may hit debris in space and crash. But the mm -hmm. idea is that of the thousands that you launch, some of them will actually go to a high enough speed in the right direction to Alpha Centauri, and then it will have like a little panel for for a solar sail, so it'll keep gaining mm -hmm. speed. And because it's so small, it would be able to go very quickly. And the hope is that mm. within 20 years or so, it could be able to send some data back so we can start to get more learnings about is Alpha Centauri a realistic place for us if like the black hole was was taking, you know, going to suck in our whole solar system and we had to yeah. escape our solar system. Is it a place that would even be worth trying to get to? Interesting. Yeah. And I mean, Alpha Centauri is only, well, I say only it's four light years away, you know? Yeah. So, so we would need to get the, would they basically send information back like through what radio waves? They wouldn't right. come back so themselves, it would, correct? So it would take a lot of, it would take time. I forget how long, but for the radio waves to come back and right now mm -hmm. everything is transmitted from radio waves and that's part of the issue. Like even if you're going on a mission to Mars or whatever, it takes minutes to get the information back. It's not like you're even traveling the speed of light. Yeah. And, right? and the that's, radio waves travel the speed of light. Right. And, the, and that's even like when you were close by, like something within mm -hmm. our little solar system. When we go further away, it takes a long time to get data back. And so mm -hmm. that's another area that I want to talk about, which is how can we solve the data science and data efficiency transmission process? Um, yeah. I mean, really, the fastest 
right now that we could transmit information back from Alpha Centauri to Earth is four years because it's four light years away. Right. So, so that's kind of the the difficulty. We could talk about, you know, maybe we Quantum can quantum entanglement wait. or that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. There's. Well, there there is one the other point about, I want to make. Yeah. I don't want us to get too deep into it before we okay. talk about the other realistic solutions, but. One point that I think is just really important to realize about space is that it, it's really hard to get anywhere the further away you go from where we are right now, just because the nature of the universe is expanding via mm -hmm. the Big Bang. It's basically like you're blowing up a balloon and the balloon is getting bigger at an increasing rate. Mm -hmm. So if you're in any point within the balloon trying to get to a point that's on the outside, it's literally expanding faster than you could go once you get to a certain distance away. So mm -hmm. it's, re it's reasonable that we could get to Alpha Centauri, which is literally the closest sun, closest star to our own sun. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, it's like just it's, it's pretty infeasible unless there are some real game changers like wormholes and black holes and things like yeah. that it's very unlikely we would we would want to go anywhere beyond Alpha Centauri with a probe. And it's unlikely we want to go anywhere beyond the asteroid belt with a real human, like a manned mission, mm -hmm. at least. Yeah. For so now. really, right. Yeah. The question is, can we achieve faster than light travel? Right. Yeah. That's, if we want to go beyond thing. Alpha Centauri, that's yeah. definitely the question. Yeah. Yeah. And of course we want to go beyond Alpha <laughs> Centauri. <laughs> We yeah. want to colonize the galaxy and the universe. But it is really interesting to talk a little bit about the universe's expansion because also, like you said, the expansion is happening at an increasing rate. So that means in billions or trillions of years, the expansion of the universe will exceed the speed of light, which means when we look up at the night sky in the far future, there will be no stars because mm -hmm. the light literally can't reach us. And it, if we don't achieve faster than light travel before then, and that also assumes that the human species is around for, you know, millions, billions, trillions of years, um, which is possible if we become a multiplanetary species. Um, the point is we need faster than light travel. If we want to be a species through the life cycle of our universe. Um, mm -hmm. Well, so let's say, maybe we, yeah, I agree with you, but let's save that for farther okay, future. Okay. Let's say rather than wanting to go beyond our own solar system, let's say our mission is more humble and we just want to colonize Mars. We, you know, we want to set up a base on the moon. We want to mm -hmm. be able to mine some asteroids so that when we run out of resources on earth, we're still able to get the resources we need. Let's say mm -hmm. we want to do that. So what are our options? So we already talked about the status quo. We already talked about light sails. Another mm -hmm. option is nuclear fission, mm -hmm. which is basically nuclear bombs. And yep. this is if, for instance, we absolutely had to get out of our solar system, like, as soon as possible, if something really bad was about to happen to our whole solar system, this is probably the path we would take because the technology exists today where the idea is basically you just drop nuclear bombs behind your ship and ride the wave of the explosions. And w by doing that, you can get pretty fast. Uh, you know, I think that was also something like 10 to 12 percent of the speed of light potentially. So you can get pretty fast with that. Mm -hmm. The problem is that it's super dangerous, especially if it's a manned mission, because you just have yeah. all of these explosions. And if anything happens to the fuel you're carrying on board, you're pretty screwed. Um, it's also not as controlled. So you can't, it's not as refined where like going in the exact right direction is as you would want. Mm -hmm. Um, Another variation of this is plutonium. You can use plutonium that's like a similar method, but, and it lasts for decades, which is part of what's so great about it, but it has the same risks. And yeah, so this is also something that you wouldn't want to use for a manned mission, but mm. 
you would want to use it potentially if you're just using a probe that you want to get out there really quickly. Um, so that's that's one option. And then the the much better option, which is still theoretical, is nuclear fusion. And yeah. this is basically what's happening in our sun. This is how the sun has energy. This is how all stars have energy. And you're actually fusing atoms together to create this stable energy that can last for a really long time. And the beautiful thing is that it occurs naturally in space, like just excess clouds of matter from the formation of planets will just yeah. fuse together and have this stable energy for a very long time. The problem is when we try to create this technology on Earth, the gravity of Earth and the magnetic poles make it much more difficult to actually create that process. It's hmm. something that's way easier to do in space and we haven't actually done it on Earth or in space. So if we were to develop this technology, we may need to actually build it out in space. Um, and even then, it's it's unclear if we would be able to do it. But there are billions of dollars that are going into fusion technology already. Mm -hmm. So that's a potential, that's a possibility as well. Right. Yeah, and we also, you know, I would also direct listeners that haven't heard our uh, Future of Nuclear episode, where we basically, we talk about this. We talk about yeah. how how fusion is basically combining smaller elements and it's a much cleaner and stable form of energy. Whereas fission, the bombs that you were talking about, is breaking apart very large atoms that are unstable and um, potentially really dangerous. So like, obviously if we have the technology and we develop the technology, fusion is definitely the way to go. And it's something that's easier for very long-term space missions because smaller atoms like helium, hydrogen, like the, the smaller atoms that are being fused together are much easier to come by in space. Right. Like you could even be collecting fuel as you're going. Or maybe let's say you have a giant starship and then little, you know, mining ships that leave the main ship, go to an asteroid, mine some, you know, smaller elements and then come back. And then it's it's a way that you can continue this travel in this exploration for years and it might even be the case that these long-term space missions are lasting the life uh, the lifetime of the explorers themselves like there right. could be a, it might be a little city that's just exploring the cosmos and they might never come back to earth yeah and Michio Kaku brought up the point that if we are able to figure out fusion technology our whole ocean is filled with hydrogen, right? Hydrogen, yeah. di hydrogen dioxide. Mm -hmm. And that would be enough fuel, like more fuel than we would need for a lot of our aspirations right now. The difficulty is just developing that technology. Right. Um, but one, one issue that we haven't talked about is that even if we were able to go 10 or 12% the speed of light through one of these technologies, like let's say we figure out fusion, we perfect it, and we're able to travel at those speeds, the G-force would absolutely destroy the physical bodies of the astronauts. Because when you're going at that speed, it's mm -hmm. just your body can't handle it. So to actually send real human beings at those speeds, unless there's some sort of, you know, like, like there's a, a wormhole where the perception of space time is maintained yeah. for the perspective of the astronauts, unless there's some, some breakthrough in that, in the physics department, it would absolutely destroy the astronaut. You would not want to be yeah. in a spaceship that's going anywhere near those speeds. So I just had an idea that's probably a bad idea, but it's, okay. it's an idea nonetheless. Um, obviously we're not going to just accelerate to 10% of the speed of light right away. But what we could do is accelerate at a constant rate and get up there, get up to the speed over some longish period of time. Let's say that acceleration was roughly one G you could, you could then have G forces in space where you're sort of, where people are kind of standing, um, 
on like the back end of the spaceship and they have essentially one G. So they're not really, it's almost like a simulated gravity environment. So it's like this really large spaceship that's, you know, going through space. And then people don't have to worry about the, the zero G situation. Right. I guess the problem with that would be you need a really large spaceship, which y- yeah, to yeah, get yeah. to those speeds, is probably, probably not that feasible, but yeah, I mean, it's a real issue. And part of this gets mm-hmm. to just the point that why the hell do we want to send actual human beings that far away? Why not just send probes and robots? And this, to me, is a much more likely scenario for what the future of space travel will be, mm-hmm. where, yeah, in certain cases, we may want to send real humans. Like, for the sake of saving humanity, we want to start a colony on places like Mars. For the sake of scientific knowledge, we probably want a few geologists to look at the surface of different moons and asteroids. But beyond that, I mean, if we're talking about going far distances it would be much better to just send some drones and then you you know you, you're sitting in houston you can just put on your vr goggles and look through the eyes of the drones and do mm-hmm. whatever you need to do yeah you know maybe you would even have something that is has the the dna code for life in it and is able to reconstruct materials using raw elements to actually create human beings based on the genetic code that's in there. So it's not like you have to send physical astronauts there and then get them to have sex the old fashioned way. You could just (laughs) have the code for life and, Mm. you know, actually just create it as needed. And the, the von Neumann probes is one, it's theoretical, but it's one thing that's been proposed, which is that if you create a small little robot, that's able to operate on quantum levels so that it actually just uses raw elements to build you know, molecules together and it has the right encoding where it can replicate itself and then when enough of them replicate, they can then build bigger new structures. This could essentially mm-hmm. be a way to you know, populate the cosmos, maybe not with human life initially, but with artificial life that we would be able to tap into and use to our advantage. But this brings us to the bigger question of what should we do? Is that the right thing to do to colonize the cosmos and just spread life to every corner? Because a lot of astronauts and philosophers think that we should really do whatever we can in our power not to spread life willy nilly and and really sort of respect the unknown compositions of these different planets that may one one day arise to become some f- version of life on that planet. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'd be interested to hear your take on it if you sway one way or the other. So I think we need to be careful about it, but I also think it's something to consider. And I say we need to be careful because if there's a planet out there that already has microorganisms like bacteria or you know whatever versions of uh, single-celled organisms a planet might have I don't think we should disturb that and we need a good way of knowing whether or not these microorganisms exist on other planets even if they don't have large complex intelligent life like earth does I don't think we should interrupt that because that might be the very start of a evolution path the same way that earth went through and mm-hmm. that, that could be that could be disruptive but if we did know that there was nothing going on on some barren planet why not populate it why not spread intelligent life through and maybe you know if people are arguing about the natural progression of things maybe that is a natural progression of right. things maybe humans evolving at some point or at in some place in the universe is one step towards intelligent life populating the cosmos and we're we're kind of that initial seed that then populates some other planets with maybe artificial life that's more robust to the um radiation that might happen maybe you know everything else that makes other planets harsh and not Mm. earth um 
artificial life might be able to handle that better and it might be able to really discover the nature of the universe you know if we're talking about true artificial intelligence it might be able to do that even better than humans it just might be the next step of evolution for us yeah and i'm curious what your thoughts are well some religious groups like scientologists they Mm -hmm. actually believe this is how life got started on earth that some alien like basically sent its genetic code to earth and then we're basically the replicas of whatever the original alien species was Hmm. so it's i mean this is totally far-fetched there's no evidence for that at all but it's interesting that some people think that's already what happened Um, interesting but i i agree with you i definitely think we shouldn't spread life unintentionally and just shoot it off to all corners of the cosmos But I do think we should spread it intentionally. So when we see a place that's worth um, that's worth colonizing or worth habitating, Mm -hmm. we should go there and we should do it in a way where first we go purely for scientific research purposes, because we want to understand what's the composition of the soil, what's the composition Mm -hmm. of the atmosphere. All of those questions need to be answered first. But then if we make a real decision to colonize that planet or that moon, I think that's something that we should do as Earthlings. I would be in support of that. Mm -hmm. Um, So then I guess the next question that that stems from that is, okay, let's say that is our mission. Where are the places worth going in our corner of the universe? And I've I've had some really interesting discussions with Kip about Mm. what's going on with NASA and what are the projects that are going to be achieved in our lifetime. Mm. And they're very exciting. So maybe we can talk a little bit about those. Yeah, please do. So the first one is probably the most exciting, which is Titan. So Titan is a moon in Saturn. And what's so awesome about it is that if you just Google a picture of Titan, it looks a lot like Earth. I mean, this is a place that has a dense atmosphere, even denser than Earth's atmosphere. It has waterfalls, ice volcanoes. It has like underground, uh, potentially liquid water. Um, It has, you know, an actual cycle of hydration where it's like, There, you know, water pools in certain areas, then it gets evaporated, then it rains. And it has methane, which is also associated with life. And people have said that it's very similar to an early Earth, like what Earth looked like before humans Hmm. came about. And so it's very fascinating place that a lot of people say is actually a much more attractive place for us to go than Mars, because Hmm. Mars is fairly barren and it doesn't have like we yes it has some ice we think but Mm -hmm. it doesn't have a hydrological cycle and this is actually the place in the avengers where thanos lives and it's sort of like his uh paradise where it's just like untouched by industry and Mm -hmm. and it's just sort of this beautiful garden of eden type of place and it's obviously not actually like that in the real world but There's a lot we don't know about it. And the big question that we may be able to answer in our lifetime is, is there life on Titan? That's something that we already have a project underway. And and the other planet that's really fascinating is Europa. So Europa is is a moon in, in Jupiter Mm-hmm. And it also has signs of water. One of the cool things about Europa is that it's actually, it has all of this potentially liquid water trapped under miles and miles of ice. So it would be hard to get through all that ice. But mm-hmm. there are these volcanoes where liquid water, like vapor, is spewing out into outer space. So our mission to Europa is going to be to analyze the water that's spewing out from those volcanoes so we can analyze what's actually going on in the water beneath the surface 
And that's another potentially fascinating place where life could exist. So just, just in case anyone wants to look into it further, the mission to Europa is called the Clipper mission. Hmm. And the mission to Titan is called the Dragonfly mission. And one other thing I'll say about Dragonfly, because I think this is the most fascinating mission that's going to occur in our lifetime, is that mm -hmm. it's literally just a drone that looks like a dragonfly. And it's actually powered by a radioisotope thermoelectric engine, which is from plutonium. So this uses one of the types of methods that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And that allows it to fly around for a very long time. It is going to be an eight year journey and it'll study the surface for two and a half years before returning. So this is planned in 2026. This is going to launch and we will know the results as assuming everything goes well by 2034. The, the wow. mission to Europa is going to launch in 2022. So this stuff is happening very soon and it's exciting because we may know that there is in fact life in our universe or sorry, in our section solar of the solar system. system at least Yeah. in the next 10, 15 years. And that would be fantastic to know. We may also learn, for instance, things about planet Earth that may help us to deal with the climate and things of that nature. Because like mm -hmm. I said, Titan is kind of like an early Earth. Yeah. Whereas Venus is another place worth exploring because that's sort of like what Earth could become if climate change runs rampant because it's like way too yeah. much greenhouse effect and captures mm -hmm. way too much and all that. Yeah. So those are probably the top places to visit. I would also say Io is interesting. That's actually the closest moon to Jupiter, but it's not as attractive as Titan or Europa because it's basically a land of fire and volcanoes and it has interesting cycles in the volcanic world mm -hmm. but we don't it doesn't look like there's water necessarily and then right. i guess the only other thing worth exploring would be the asteroid belt like some of these asteroids have tons of materials that are very valuable and mm -hmm. so to me those are like that's what i'd be really curious to explore titan europa Maybe Io, Venus, you know, obviously Mars, our own yep. moon, and then the asteroid, mm -hmm. the asteroids that are valuable. Like those are really the top places that are worth traveling in my mind. Right. Yeah, there's so much there. What do you think um, about maybe going to those places? Let's say we find um, life. Do we send humans there do we like actually explore the place i'm curious uh what your thoughts are on you know what what do we do if we find life right so i mean there are so many questions that first of all we want to know how is this life similar or different from life on earth right and this could open up a whole new world of possibilities for what a different form of life could be like, because we only know the, t the variation that occurs here on Earth. Mm -hmm. If it's similar to our own earthly life, who knows what that could bring? I mean, anytime we find a new species in the Amazon forest, of, of which many are still undiscovered, there are potential mm -hmm. medical benefits. We could use gene editing to get whatever the best traits of those forms of life are. We could create pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. um, it could help with the advancement of AI. I mean, there's there's so many ways that finding life could be fascinating, but mm -hmm. also just in a philosophical sense to know whether or not we are the only instances of, quote, intelligent life out there. To know mm -hmm. definitively, yes, there are other forms of life in our solar system or no, there are not. That's not the end of the question because we can always go further but it'd be really good to know. And that's sort of one of my big hopes for in our lifetime to figure out definitively, is there life in our solar system? Right. Yeah, I'm totally with you. I don't really know what that would do in our civilization and just it would probably society. only be trending on Twitter for like five days and then people would move yeah. on to the next thing. But do you think, <laughs> but the thing is like, 
it seems like something of that magnitude might make people be like oh shit like yeah there'd there's... be a lot of good memes for sure <laughs> <laughs> oh jeez yeah well that's and then people would focus on go. the peloton ad the new peloton ad instead oh my gosh yeah <laughs> i haven't even caught up with that whole but thing. when i, I just when I talk to biologists and earth scientists and space uh -huh. people interested in space, that's what it all, like when I'll ask them, why are you doing this? Why are you dedicating your life? What's so interesting about this to you? It usually comes down to, we want to know if there's other life in the universe. Like that's really the big question. So it'd be interesting to see if we answer that with an affirmative, even if it's like a relatively uninteresting, you know, microorganism. Mm -hmm. How would that change people's motivations within science? Would they get even more excited or would they kind of feel like, you know, kind of like landing on the moon? Like, OK, we did the main thing we want to do. Uh, oh, see, I think it would just excite everything. Now, I think I think it would cause more unrest than what you might initially think. So what happens to religion, for example, if there is life on another planet? That's interesting. So it did God create that? Did you know well, like religious who, people would was, probably just say like it's fake news. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but like, like if people you're... still say the moon landing is fake. So it's uh, hard yeah. to it's hard to give that's... too much trust in the public. Yeah, that's true. I just I think that it would really get us to the next level of understanding. And all of these missions are getting us to a point where we understand physics better, we're going to understand mm -hmm. biology better, and just kind of the the workings of the universe. And the more we do that, like we're just going to keep progressing. And then we might eventually get to the point where we can expand beyond the solar system. And maybe we talk about that. We talk about some of those like further future technologies. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. So there are a couple of ways that we can go outside of our solar system and achieve faster than light travel. Um, the first is uh, wormholes. Yeah. And the second is through a sort of warp drive. Right. So I, I'll, I can start on that. So okay. one thing that's interesting with wormholes is that Einstein was aware of them, but he was lacking a clear image of how they worked within the fabric of space-time and the image that many physicists feel like he was missing is the image of strings and now since the time of Einstein we have string theory and string theory basically purports that when the Big Bang occurred it's like you have this initial starting point and then mm -hmm. it blows up but almost like you could imagine it as like a ball of thread that sort of like is expanding outward and the threads are still intertwined. And so you have these connections in different points along the space-time continuum where you could actually go tunnel from one to the other through a wormhole. And so it's not so much a hole as it is like a string that you're going through that's connected. So one potential means of space travel would be to go through the natural paths of the strings and you could sort of imagine a future where we map out where each of these strings end up through some way that we're able to yeah. measure knowledge that doesn't exist yet. Another way would be, mm -hmm. well, why go through the natural strings? Why not just create our own path? Like basically wormhole tunneling. And right. this gets into the idea that was popularized in Star Trek called a warp drive. And this is, to me, like the ideal like perhaps best case scenario for what space travel would be i have other things to say in our official best case so i'll, I'll give you this uh -huh. little tidbit but so imagine you're on a spaceship right and you say okay we want to go from here to alpha centauri right now you're like right around where the moon is on earth all you would do is you would basically point to where you want to go and then it's like a caterpillar sort of like inching in space time like so, and then you just tunnel right through it so it's basically like hmm. imagine you're like bringing you're literally that's why it's called a warp drive you're literally warping mm -hmm. space time crunching it up 
and then just going right through that hole to the other end. Now, this is yeah. purely theoretical. And the one of the other hallmarks of the warp drive is that to the astronaut, it seems like a normal amount of time has passed. So maybe five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever have passed. And causality is maintained within the spaceship. So nothing weird happens in the spaceship. The only mm -hmm. weirdness that happens is when you actually tunnel through your own wormhole to get to that other point along the space-time continuum. And that would be like the best way to travel because it's like minimal time, there's no weirdness, and you know you can yeah. get to wherever you need to. You don't have to rely on the natural paths of the strings in reality. Right. Yeah, there's there's so much here and, and a lot of it is is theoretical and you know, physically possible the way we understand physics today. Now the thing with um, string theory is th like it's a very debated topic if that's even a thing. Like are these are there actually wormholes that are scattered throughout the universe and how would we even find them? Um, but, you know, if we did create our own uh, wormholes, we would somehow need to keep those wormholes open. Like, that's the biggest thing that we would need to do, uh, the hardest thing we would need to do. So how do we keep a wormhole open? If the string theory thing is true, there, those uh, the string theory wormholes basically say that the strings are keeping the wormholes open. Mm -hmm. And with the – if we created one, we would need some – some sort of exotic matter to keep them open. And this, this would be a matter that exerts negative, that has negative mass. So it would be like a negative gravity thing. And it would, it would keep these wormholes open. And the amount of energy that this exotic matter would need to exert is totally inconceivable to us right now. Right. It's like, it's like the, um, uh, the same energy that's at the center of a neutron star, which is right. rid again ridiculous. But in the far future, there's if these are physically possible, we could we could get there, right? And and right. it's a way for us to travel thousands, millions, billions of light years in a matter of seconds, and that is how we colonize the universe because we can't. We're not going to colonize the cosmos unless we can achieve faster than light. And that seems like a really good candidate. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a couple of interesting things with the warp drives where you're essentially compressing space time in front of the ship or the direction you're going, which mm -hmm. there might not be a front. It might just be any direction. Um, and expanding space time towards the uh, the opposite end of like the opposite direction that you're going have you so this is going to be sort of out there i don't know how i think about this yet but have you heard any of the podcasts like let's say joe rogan he talked to bob lazar for example the guy who's who allegedly worked on some like extraterrestrial space um craft and then recently on kevin rose's podcast a uh, fighter pilot came on and said there like pilots have been seeing weird things throughout the history of aviation mm -hmm. and they don't look like any sort of spacecraft that has ever been conceived like they're sort of these uniform objects that are just bolting to and from places like there's not right. really an acceleration they just kind of go and it's it's a very weird um path that some of these objects take and again i don't know how i feel about it i'm just kind of saying what you know these these fighter pilots and bob lazar is who also have their fair share of criticism um but even the dod recently released footage of a ufo or right or a, i saw that yeah so there's there's a lot going on there but i wonder if the warp drive is a more likely faster than light travel technology um more likely than, than what? wormholes than wormholes, wormholes yeah um it's hard to say i mean it's... i don't know if you saw neil degrasse tyson tweeted at elon musk the other day and he said hey elon why don't you stop dabbling around with 
you know, it's self-driving cars and, and rockets. <laughs> and why don't you create a warp drive? Sincerely, all the space geeks of the world. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. So, I saw that. So it is like, you know, it is something that legitimate people talk about. To your point about alien technology or UFOs, I would say that my own feeling is that, yes, they're unidentified flying objects. The question mm -hmm. is, are they unidentified because they're super advanced earthly technologies or are they unidentified because they truly are beyond the scope of what's possible on Earth? Mm -hmm. You know, it's because it's not like the top defense departments and technology companies always tell the public about all the stuff that they're developing. So that's one right. real possibility. But it does seem like there are a lot of reports from Air Force pilots and other very credible people that it does seem like, who knows, it could be possible that some more advanced species is just keeping an eye on us, whether it's just out of curiosity or whether they mm -hmm. want to make sure we don't get to the point where we create von Neumann probes and start to colonize everything like a virus in the, in the universe. And then they would maybe, you know, clamp down on us a bit. Who knows? <laughs> it's possible for sure. I don't yeah, worry too much about it. I don't about know about it. the likeliness. Right. Um, but I want to think that it's a thing. You know, obviously, I, yeah. my, in my mind, I think it's more likely that that's not the case, just given what we know. Right. But at the same time, like you said, it could be possible. And the way that they describe these objects, their movements are more consistent with a sort of warp drive right. technology right. where they're just like bouncing around in all of these different directions. Like there's not a, a propulsion, like a rocket propulsion that's giving them some sort of momentum going forward. It's just like they are moving. But right, from our right. perspective, if, if we were on the outside looking at a warp drive ship, it would just look like they were bouncing all over the place. Right, um, right. And then from the perspective of the people in the ship, it's just like they're not moving at all. And supposedly that's something that would be possible within centuries um, for us, which makes, you know, I, I well, the, the other, the other interesting option that we haven't talked about is mm -hmm. antimatter drives. Yeah. So yeah. what's fascinating here is that most of the mass of the universe is not what we call matter. It's actually antimatter. So all of like the empty space that we see, it's not just empty nothingness. There's, there's actually dark matter and dark energy. And that mm -hmm. comprises the majority of mass, the majority of what's out there. We are actually sort of the weird ones in that, like the small amount of, you know, visible sensory reality that we call like matter and real stuff is just a small percentage of what's really there. So if there were a way to tap into the dark energy or the dark matter, you mm -hmm. could potentially reach much very high speeds. So that's that's another and, and there wouldn't be like a typical kind of propulsion that you have in like the world of matter that so it's possible that some of the ships you're talking about if they are real um, yeah that they could have antimatter drives and hmm. I, I and some people have said that that's sort of connected to like black holes or where it's like you're sucking energy out of like this version of reality into like the other version of reality where maybe time moves backwards or there's mm. some other weirdness going on where things are just the laws of physics are totally flipped in that yeah. reality. So if you could like suck out power from like the, 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 uh, the upside down world, <laughs> you could power yourself in this world tremendously. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So I wonder if um, maybe there's a, I think there's a difference between dark energy and um, antimatter or dark matter and antimatter. Because the way, I think, well, they're both really confusing. Because antimatter is, it doesn't really exist. Well, that It's not that prevalent in our universe. Because like, there's always matter and antimatter pairs. Right. And when, when matter and antimatter collide, it's it they releases energy themselves. yeah right. so that's what the drive would be is like you have the normal 
protons going in with the mm -hmm. anti-protons and they annihilate each other and that creates this energy that would essentially propel yeah. whatever the ship is yeah and it's it's so dense it's one of the densest forms of uh energy that we can conceive of right now so i saw some video some um the ceo of this company called positron technologies and a positron is just the the antimatter version of electron mm -hmm. um but basically he said that a hundred grains of antimatter salt would be the equivalent of a spaceship getting us into orbit. Wow. And it's by far the most expensive thing that physicists can create. I think I saw something it's in the trillions of dollars for a gram of antimatter. And the problem is when you're trying to store antimatter, well, you can't really in traditional ways because if it touches regular matter, which is everywhere, right. it'll annihilate itself and blow up. Yeah, now, the, and we the, can create this. Like in the big, uh, yeah, large Hadron exists. Collider, we can create a very small amount of antimatter, which is just fascinating that we yes. can do it. And there, there have been ways that physicists figured out that we can store antimatter. And that's through this sort of... Mag so you have to have it in a vacuum, but you have mm -hmm. to exert forces through a vacuum to kind of keep antimatter in the center of this vacuum. Because if it touches the wall of the vacuum, you're done, mm -hmm. right? So you, you need to have a vacuum, and you also need these magnetic forces that are maintaining this antimatter and kind of forcing it to the center of this vacuum space so it just stays there. And we would need to figure out how to keep it there, which is... I mean, it's awesome, but it's also a lot of work to uh, get this uh, right. working. But really, antimatter could be potentially, and it has been, you know, the source of a lot of science fiction, like Star Trek and all of these other movies kind of talk about antimatter drives mm -hmm. because it is, you know, theoretically a very dense form of energy. It's just really hard to control right now. Right. But, probably far less difficult to control than a wormhole yeah so it, it's like we have this progression of space travel where like maybe the first thing that we need to do is create a space or a sky hook or a space tether that will help us you know launch ourselves in like within our solar system and then maybe fission and fusion reactors and then maybe an antimatter drive and then maybe beyond that, centuries down the road, we can start talking about, about wormholes and warp drives and right. um, teleportation. Yeah, teleportation, which is essentially a wormhole. Or is yeah. it, do you have another? Um, yeah. So I mean, for teleportation, teleportation, one thing I found interesting is that in 2017, scientists successfully teleported a particle from Earth to space in an experiment. Interesting. And this is something that's something we can do with a particle, but when you have bigger <laughs> molecules and that sort of thing, it becomes much more difficult. And this sort of leverages quantum entanglement. But the problem with teleportation is that, other than that, we're not very good at it and it's still very early. If you were to teleport your actual self, you probably would die and then you would just recreate a new version of yourself. So it's not something I would sign up for in the early days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, that's why to me, like the most interesting thing is just transmitting data at like light speeds or potentially greater than light speeds. So you could just, rather than traveling to all these places, you're just like in VR, like exploring through probes and then you take off your VR set and you lay down on the couch and you hang out with your dog. You don't have to like be out in cold space for like decades. So, yeah. but anyways, I think maybe we should get into the future scenarios because we, we've laid the groundwork of what's possible and now we can put it together for what do we think is going to occur in the best case, the worst case and the most likely case. So, Matamor, what do you think about the worst case scenario? Worst case scenario. 
My worst case scenario is that the hostile geopolitics of Earth spread to space. Mm. Now, this seems unlikely when you think, okay, is there really going to be a Star Wars-like scenario where there's the Empire and then there's the Senate and there's these warring ships? I'm not saying that's necessarily likely, but what I am thinking is likely is that unless we really solve the geopolitical problems here on Earth, there is going to be a perception of space as another frontier for warfare, another Mm -hmm. frontier to have military bases. Now, Mm -hmm. to put this into more concrete terms, China is already plotting to create a base on the moon. They're going to plant their flag, and that's going to be their base to do all kinds of stuff that they don't publicize. Mm -hmm. SpaceX plans to colonize Mars, and that's something that's underway, but it seems more like it's just for the good of humanity as a whole. It's not as much about, you know, the USA in particular. Mm -hmm. Planetary Resources is a company that is planning to start mining asteroids. And... NASA is planning missions to Europa and Titan. So all of these four initiatives will be underway in the year 2030. Now, it's not like we're going to solve all of our geopolitical problems by the year 2030. So you could very easily see a scenario where people are vying for different materials and they're vying mm-hmm. for different bases that can have strategic advantages so that you can better mine materials. For instance, even with the Skyhook, which seems like a no-brainer, like we should definitely do something like this because the benefits are so great and because we know it's feasible from an engineering perspective, even that requires geopolitical cooperation that may mm-hmm. be beyond what we're currently able to. Like. How happy would China be if we just announced that we're going to build this giant sky hook in, you know, in uh, just beyond Earth's orbit, right? Like they probably wouldn't be too happy about that. And already people in the U.S. are concerned that our satellites are essentially like these delicate, beautiful machines that are big, juicy targets for any country that's trying to make a name for itself in the space race. So part of my worst case scenario is also that if there were some occurrences in space where one country blows up another country's satellites, it's going to create a lot of space trash and debris, which will make it harder for us to go and do scientific missions and colonization missions in the future. And it's also, it also may be really hard to know who shot down the satellite. Like, it's already hard enough on Earth when a drone attacks a Saudi oil field. We mm. think it was Iran, but we don't really know for sure. It's, that, it's way harder to figure out and do forensics in outer space and to know who actually blew up your satellite or not. There could be a lot of sabotage in space, mm. especially if conditions on Earth get worse. And this is part of my, this is also part of my worst case scenario. If we just put too much of our focus on colonizing different parts of space and getting the hell off of this planet and we stop caring about protecting the planet we have and Mm -hmm. we just use all of our resources to get elsewhere or to mine for, for the benefit of the few shareholders in these companies and we don't care as much about the actual people still living on earth then Mm -hmm. that could be sort of a cascading effect where conditions on Earth get worse, competition in space gets worse, and then just the net effect is a lot more hostility and geopolitical uncertainty. So that's, that would be my worst case scenario. Yeah, I mean, you touched on a lot of things that I'm also worried about, um, particularly the, the political issues just expanding into space and how like how do we determine ownership Mm -hmm. and how do we how do we know like how do we split up the resources of space because that's ultimately what starts wars in the first place is access to resources that will be something like 
resources in general is something that space can offer almost a limitless potential of in terms of minerals and rare materials that might be useful for you know really extreme physics experiments in the future and other things so yeah i i kind of echo what you're saying there the one thing that i also would say is in the worst case it's almost like the geo the issues that are happening now on earth sort of continue where this where there's sort of anti-science movement so maybe this is more like within the u.s but people don't want to be physicists people don't want to be researchers they want to be influencers <laughs> and like and we have a anti-truth movement in politics right now um, particularly on the far right and the far left and what happens if scientific progress is just kind of slowed to a snail's pace because mm -hmm. of the, these sort of pressures to not explore things. And that that's part of the worst case because it basically means we can't even do any of the things we were talking about in the first place. Right. I always find um, it funny least... where it's like a lot of scientists and theoretical physicists would be like, well, we know that relativity is the case. We know that String theory is the best theory we have, but uh, and when they say we know, it's like we, the very narrow community of scientists that are most up to date and accept all of like science and reason up to this point. Whereas if you actually take we as what does the average person believe, it is very different from from that. Mm -hmm. It's like a lot of it's similar to what people believed in the Middle Ages. Yeah, yeah, and that's the problem. Because if, if that happens, if uh, the social norms are to kind of reject science and we, we kind of regress into this state, funding is going to dry up. We're not going to be able to run experiments at all that are going to get us to the point. Because this is – everything we've talked about is insanely expensive. And I worry that if – people start to change their perspective on space exploration, general physics, then we're not going to be able to make the progress that we want to make. And it might be, it might be millennia before we make any of the progress that we've been talking about. Sure. We'll, you know, we'll get to Mars because there's, there's a financial incentive and Elon Musk and SpaceX and Blue Origin and some of these companies aren't necessarily beholden to, the public's view but that can only last so long because if they're not being funded by nasa and other publicly funded agencies then you know progress might just come to a standstill and that's what i'm really worried about other than the points that you made as well yeah that's great so what do you think about the best case best case scenario for my best case scenario, I want to talk about what Elon Musk's best case is that he's stated and what Jeff Bezos' best case is that he's stated. So for Elon Musk, it is essentially creating a backup hard drive of humanity on Mars so that if something happens on Earth, like an asteroid or nuclear fallout or massive pandemic or whatever it is, we can continue. The light of consciousness can live on. That's mm -hmm. something I think we can all agree on. Jeff mm -hmm. Bezos' idea, I almost like even more. I mean, they're both really good. Jeff Bezos' mm -hmm. best case is that we can turn Earth into a garden of paradise where all heavy industry, infrastructure, mining, extracting resources, building things, all of that can be outsourced to space and to asteroids and to other places so that earth can basically become the best possible version that it can be to it be able to support and sustain life of all varieties so i love that idea mm -hmm. and you have amazon fulfillment centers on the moon it'll be great <laughs> <laughs> so, it's like giant manufacturing yeah. facilities I'm not, that'll by make the way, anything that you want i'm not saying i necessarily love the idea of like amazon owning everything but I love uh -huh. the idea of Earth being protected as sort of this haven for life 
and we do all the other stuff we need to do, like getting resources from mm. space, from mining asteroids and whatnot. Interesting. So those, those to me are really good ways of thinking about it. As far as what specific discoveries would we make in the best case, I would say figuring out if there is life in our solar system definitively. That's number one, especially with Titan, Europa, potentially Io, uh, studying Venus. The other discovery that I would love to be made is to have a good sense, maybe not a definitive sense, but a good sense of if there is life on Alpha Centauri. Mm -hmm. And in general, I hope that the so-called second golden age of space travel, which is what we're in right now, which happened with like, you know, the launch of SpaceX and the renewed interest from Blue Origin mm -hmm. and all these other private companies, that mm -hmm. this not only sparks innovation with space travel, but it also sparks innovation that can help us here on Earth. And a lot of right. the inventions that we take for granted now, even something like the electric screwdriver, that was only developed because we needed a way to screwdrive things in space with zero gravity when astronauts have a million other things to worry about. So we created this electric screwdriver that now people use every day. And that's like a you know relatively unimportant example, but there are lots mm -hmm. of technologies like GPS and, and mm -hmm. you know all of these other tech that only came about because we had to solve for a problem in space, which is a lot more difficult than solving for problems on Earth. So my best case scenario is that that helps usher in a new era of innovation, a new era of protecting our planet, and hopefully a new era of global cooperation where all different countries start to realize that we should, start, we should focus on tackling the problems that are, span all of humanity and all of life, like climate change and creating a backup program for Earth and that that allows us to overcome our geopolitical differences too. Yeah. Yeah, I really resonate with Jeff Bezos' um, best case scenario and his vision for what space can be. Because that's, that's what we've talked about so many times on this podcast, is like leveraging technology to make it seem almost non-existent to, in our day-to-day -day lives. Like we can be sort of one with nature while leveraging technology it's like this techno nature utopia mm -hmm. and that's kind of what i get from that description of what he's saying um so yeah and the other thing to, that i want to really highlight that you said is when we make these innovations and when companies like spacex and blue origin exist we one discover things that are totally unrelated to physics. That's, like you said, that's huge. Like we, even if all of these missions are a failure, quote unquote, we're probably still going to learn things that are useful for, in terms of medicine, in terms of computation, in terms of um, data science, like all of these things are going to be pushed forward just because the nature of these projects are so multifaceted and have, you know, they have uh, concepts that reach into different fields and mm -hmm. they have um, components that reach into other fields. And the other thing to mention is with those companies, interest is actually really picking up, right? It's kind of the opposite of what I was saying with my worst case. I think in general, there are more people that are interested in space exploration than there are totally opposed to it. And I think that a lot of people, a lot of kids look up to Elon Musk and SpaceX and want to work for companies like that, that are really trying to explore the cosmos. And I think that that's leading to a really good scenario. Now, in terms of my actual best case, it's a very far out future. Okay, like centuries. let's see it. it's, it's sort of what we were talking about with faster than light travel. In the best case, we do achieve faster than light travel at some point, whether this is through a warp drive technology or we figure out how to um, 
maintain wormholes or we map wormholes that already exist in the universe. And ultimately what this leads to is humans or whatever our succession is, whether that's a sort of biological, artificial or biological and synthetic um, AI or, you know, future intelligence, super intelligence. Um, I don't know what the life is going to look like, but ultimately I think whatever we are in the future, as long as we don't destroy ourselves in the process is going to be something that can colonize the cosmos and really get a true understanding for what the nature of reality is. What, like, what is, what is the theory of everything? Mm -hmm. What is, what is the, you know, what, what is the actual origin of the universe? And I think these sorts of um, technologies that we're working towards are moving us in a direction where we will actually understand our place in the universe. And it'll, it'll almost be the answers that religion could never answer. And it'll give us reasons for why we're here, where we're going, where we came from, like all of these things that are sort of the fundamentals of philosophy and religion. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that in the best case, we do get to a point where we understand physics enough and we can answer, you know, the most important questions in my mind to, you know, all of humanity and all of life really in the universe. And who knows where it goes beyond that, right? Do we, does this civilization last beyond the life of the universe? Like, can we jump to other universes? Who knows? Like, it, it might be possible, but... I just, I think there's so much we don't know. And in the best case, we just keep uncovering things. And hopefully, if there are more and more people and we can really colonize the universe and the cosmos, we will have enough people and enough progress to where the pace at which civilization progresses is completely inconceivable and unfathomable to our minds right now just because we're we're really just little ants compared to what we could be in the future and that's that's sort of my best case it's a very long-term future like on the order of thousands or maybe tens of thousands of years um or maybe centuries who knows i don't know how fast we can progress um i think we can progress pretty quick if we you know do things right right now today um yeah, so yeah that's that's it. my best case Awesome. What do you think uh, for the likely scenario? Most likely scenario. My likely scenario is that we do the main missions that I've already outlined. So Titan, Europa, Venus, mm -hmm. the moon... But one thing I want to mar remark on in my most likely scenario is the problem of data science. And this mm -hmm. to me seems like one of the greatest problems that we're going to have to solve in the next decade if we want to actually make this a reality. And part of, so just to give a sense for how difficult it is to crunch this data, the largest radio telescope ever built was built in 2018. It's called the Square Kilometer Array, SCA for short. Mm -hmm. And it generates 700 terabytes of data every second. So yeah. it's one thing to create this telescope. It's another thing to actually make sense of this data. And, you know, you're a data yeah. scientist, Justin, to yeah. actually take all of this information and make use and turn it into useful insights is no easy task. And I find it interesting yeah. to even consider with all the data we have, would we even be able to know for certain if we were, for instance, receiving radio transmission from another intelligent life, life form? Like we, we honestly probably would miss it. Or, you know, there's yeah. every couple months, there's some news story about how, oh, these scientists, they think they're hearing radio waves. And then everyone just kind of debates it. And they're like, yeah, maybe it is, or maybe it's this, or maybe it's that. And the problem mm -hmm. is we're gathering all this data, but a lot of the times we can't make sense of it. So to yeah. me, it seems like, 
yes, we can make progress with us analyzing all this data and visualizing it and making sense of it, but we may need greater advances in artificial intelligence to really make use of it. So in yeah. my most likely scenario, we're not able to achieve any of the major breakthroughs that we talked about with you know traveling at the speed of light, near the speed of light, or even faster than the speed of light until we really have truly artificially super intelligent AI. Now, I don't know when that's gonna be. You guys can listen to our other episodes uh, about the future of AI. But I really think that's going to be sort of a determining factor of how soon we're able to get these new untested technologies in the working. Mm. That, that's not to say that we can't still, still achieve some of the other missions. Like I, I put my, best, my most likely as similar to my best case scenario in that I would not be surprised if we found life outside of Earth in our lifetime just based mm -hmm. on the missions that are, that are ongoing. Mm -hmm. So I think that's likely. I, I also think it's likely that we are gonna have new innovations based on these missions, like even just having the Dragonfly drone, uh, you know, be, being able to go for, run for years on these like plutonium engines and being mm -hmm. able to take all of these samples and send it back to Earth, I mean, that just shows you how much innovation that there is still to come on Earth. Mm -hmm. So my most likely scenario is that it's gonna be very difficult to solve the data science problem, but we're gonna to continue to make progress and we will likely reach a tipping point once we have artificial general intelligence where we can seriously start exploring mm -hmm and making sense of the data and having drones and probes do all of our dirty work when it comes to exploring and traversing interstellar space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so first before uh, getting into my likely, I can touch a little bit on the, the data science yeah, yeah. thing that you uh, mentioned. So like you said, there's a lot of data that's coming in every second. A lot of data more data than we can process actually so really what the state of the art is now is to use some sort of machine learning and some sort of um, filters immediately as the data is coming in and figure out what data points are important and what data points are not important and that's a it's actually something where there's been a I think a reasonable amount of pro uh, progress but the problem is the data that's coming in is mostly noise, meaning it's mostly just random fluctuations or see now the problem is there maybe they're just seemingly, seemingly random. random. Mm -hmm. And and if they're just seemingly random, we might be throwing away a lot of data and looking at things that are a false signal. And we you know, that could have been something that that we've been running into. Maybe intelligent species from you know alpha centauri or further are masking their radio communications with noise and maybe it's a sort of um you know cryptography that we're not really capable of understanding like alien right Morse now. code <laughs> yeah like, yes it, there's there's a lot that could be happening that we just we don't understand and the problem like you said is how do we how do we get true signal from all of this data coming in because right now we can't look at all the data so we're throwing right. out a vast majority of the data that's coming in even searching for that's life we just assume it's going to be similar to the conditions that had life arise on earth but it's totally mm -hmm. possible life could arise in a very different way that we maybe wouldn't be yeah. actively searching for right yeah and that's the problem so and we're also assuming that radio waves are the main form of communication with an intelligent species. What if it's something else that we just, we have no idea. Mm -hmm. Now I'm, again, I'm sure physicists have thought about this. I'm not working in CERN or one of these like Oak Ridge National Lab or anything along those lines, but there are definitely assumptions that we'll, that physicists have to make in what data they select and what data they analyze. Um, so mm -hmm. that's, 
something that, again, if there's like, if we have listeners that are deciding what to do in life, this, like this sort of direction towards, towards getting really informed in physics and data and just understanding how all of it works is huge. Like I really don't see a future where funding for this kind of stuff dries up Mm -hmm. and it's just going to keep getting more and more money behind it. And I think companies like SpaceX, Blue Origin are really driving the needle in terms of like publics, in terms of the public's um, excitement around this. And the companies are like, I think in the past we were kind of dependent on people like Carl Sagan to get like individual people to get people excited about nature, like the um, exploration of the cosmos. But now we have companies that can last beyond the life of Elon Musk and last beyond the life of Jeff Bezos. And that could be a recipe for continued funding if as long as these companies keep making progress. And since it's kind of been put into a more capitalist structure where progress is a little bit easier rather than like a a government funded Mm -hmm. um, project that might make, make our progress in this space a lot faster than we think it'll come. And I'm, I'm excited about that. Like I'm with you in that. I think the likely scenario is actually similar to the best case scenario. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the term, the, question is what is the timeline now with all of this interest and the progress in data science and I think there is quite a bit of progress going on in data science now there's probably not as much progress in terms of analyzing physics data as there is with analyzing user data which is the one like I think the direction of data science is more in um, terms of analyzing it's consumer data. more about data. understanding and manipulating human behavior rather than yeah, understanding is, and manipulating the laws of physics. Yeah, so I think that's going to be the, the slow down is going to be like, what is the focus of data science? Like you said, I think that's a really good point. Um, but yeah, I do think at some point in the future, kind of like how um, Sam Harris argues, if we make any progress and continue to make progress, there will be a point where we can achieve artificial intelligence. Analogous to that is what we're talking about. If we keep making progress, we're going to achieve, maybe first it's, we're going to have a space tether. We're going to have a antimatter drive or a fusion drive or and then beyond that maybe we are going to have warp drives and we don't know for sure yet if wormholes are actually possible to traverse through but if they are we're going to figure it out and we're going to do it at some point it's kind of honestly I, i always think about how life is kind of like a choose your own adventure game it's a mm-hmm. single player yeah. choose your own adventure game and a lot of the time if you don't put yourself out there to try the next crazy thing you're never going to unlock that achievement but if yeah. you do keep testing what is possible you can unlock these ridiculous achievements like who would have thought that einstein could find an equation that's an inch long that describes the nature of reality better than anything previously and that yeah. all of the known laws of the universe can be written on a single sheet of paper, like e- including string yeah. theory. Who would have thought that we'd be able to unlock those secrets? And if you never try to unlock the next round of secrets, you're, you're obviously dooming yourself for failure. But if you're willing to put yourself out there, at least so far, there's never been a time where we just stop making progress and stop making discoveries. So I'm very hopeful as long as we stay optimistic and determined to travel space. Right. Yeah, I'm totally with you. I think maybe that's a a good place to wrap it up, too. Yeah, awesome. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening. This has been the future of space travel. And we'll see you next time. The past, the present, and the future.
Hey futurists, if you've made it this far, you might be wondering who created the Hence the Future theme song. It was created by the Walden Brothers, and you can find them on Spotify. The Walden Brothers also produced the sound bites for the worst case, the best case, and the most likely future scenarios. At Hence the Future, we're always looking for ways to improve the quality of our episodes and our predictions. To that end, we're building a team of researchers to curate the most authoritative and highly vetted sources as the foundation for every episode. If you'd like to support these efforts, you can donate a small monthly amount at anchor.fm slash hence the future. And if you haven't done so already, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate your support.